morning. Welcome. Good turnout. Uh, we're going to start this with prayer. Father God, to you the glory. We ask your blessings and favor today. We know that we cannot be successful in anything without your presence. You are our sovereign God, and we thank you all we, for all we have and all that we may accomplish. To you we give all the glory and submit ourselves to your will. We ask your protection over all of us in this effort. We ask for cover on all that those that have come. We plead for your protection over each and every one as we leave. Let our thoughts and actions be guided by you. All glory and honor to God our Father. Amen. Please stand for the pledge. This is our second forum for the year. Uh, we're going to, you, those of you who have been here before know that we at Ramona Teed are trying to educate people, to let them know what's going on in our society. Today is one battleground, one front on all, everything that is happening. We have so much that we're facing, and we ask for your prayers, we ask for your dedication. We can tell you so many things, but until you take part and become a part of what's going on in this country, it's the only way this is going to change. We are facing an election that I think our country's future rests on where we go from here. You've got a choice to make. Get involved. Do not sit on the sidelines. Do not give up if your man is not the one who's going to be going for president. Please do not back out. Don't get cynical on this. We have got to participate in this and push forward. And maybe we won't get everything we want, but we, this is not a race, a foot race, not a 100-yard dash. This is a marathon, folks. We've got a lot of ground to take back. So I'm encouraging you, I say this every time, I'm encouraging you to get involved, get other people, in particular young people. You saw what Brigitte said about what's happening in the school systems. You're going to hear more about that today. That is, there is so much brainwashing going on and pre-programming to take the generation, our next generation, away from us. That's what they're working on. And if you don't pay attention, it'll happen. You, I'm sure I've turned around and looked, how the hell did this happen? Where did this come from? That's what's happening, folks. They, they know and are working. They're very smart at this thing. They're not dummies. So that's what you've got to face. And we're going to do our part here at Ramona T to educate you, to inform you, and then you've got to make the decisions and then take action. All right. Um, you, how, how many here have seen our uh, website? Okay, there's a lot who haven't. I encourage you to go to www.ramonateed.com. You've got handouts on here that show it. And one of the things at the top across the yellow bar here is the uh, gun runner. Uh, this is something that we've been maintaining. It's a complete timeline from when it started, when it first became exposed, right up to today. Some concerns that we have is that we're not sure, but the dedication or impetus from the Republicans in Congress seems to be waning a little bit. We don't know if a deal has been made in the back room. We're not sure. But we need to put the pressure on Boehner and ISA to keep plugging away at this thing. It's all there. And if we can make that one domino start to fall, it'll come down. But it's ugly as to what happened. I'm, you guys can look on that site. It will tell you what happened with Gunrunner and how it got to where it is now and how much it was perverted from what it, was start, what it had started out to be. So pay attention to that. I became a part of Ramona T a couple of years ago. And unfortunately, not unfortunately, it's just part of, the, part of what comes with the territory. Uh, I'm a member of the 3C club. I'm a Christian, I'm a conservative, and I'm of a color. And friends just can't, friends and family going, what's wrong with you? You know, what kind of, I'm 70 years old. I've been in this country, born 1941 in Washington, D.C. And I've told this before, but Washington, D.C. at that time was run by Southern Democrats. 
Can you imagine what it was for people of color at that time? So that's how I grew up in this country, and I've seen the transitions. I went through all of the civil rights movement and all that. And I had a revelation that I cannot go through my life being prejudiced against somebody else for their color because that's what I've been fighting all my life. Like Martin Luther King said, I want people to be judged on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. So that's how I got involved in the Tea Party. And I, t I take some flack for that, but I have a certain foundational belief. And if I don't live up to those, then what's worth it? What is it worth? So I joined this group, and they're a wonderful group of hardworking folks, and we have one thing in mind. We want to return this nation to a constitutional republic. Okay? That's where we're headed. I'm going to start running off at the mouth here. Um, I really appreciate all of you showing up here and come back. But above all, please get involved. Please get involved with what's happening to our country. It's up to you. You're we the people. And we need to let these folks in Washington and Sacramento and in the city councils and the county and every, down to the dog catcher, who they work for. They work for us. They don't, we don't work for them. They think we, that's the way it is. But no, we're going to change that. And then we've got to take it back every bit at a time. Okay? So thank you for coming. Uh, we've got Dan Summers is going to come up and talk a little bit. Good morning. No. We are in the political fight of our lifetimes. Let's participate. Good morning. Settle down. <laughs> On behalf of the steering committee of Ramona Teed, we want to welcome you to this event. We thank you for coming. I understand you've come from all over the place, and that's exciting to us. One of the things we want to do, and we want to make sure you understand, is this beautiful theater we have every month for our events for free. The, pro pro the owners of the theater, Oren and Cheryl Day, let us use the theater for free. Oren's right back there. Let's thank him. <laughs> Another way to thank him is to visit that concession stand. Okay? Now, Oren had a great week out at Lake Ramona this week. <laughs> And he's made a big pot of fish eye stew. Okay? I want you to go out and have a big bowl of that. And you'll never forget your day in Ramona. Okay. No, we got beer and pizza and nachos and hot dogs and pork and beans out there. So at uh, intermission, please go out and uh, participate. Thank you. Now. These events cost money to put on. I'm sure you realize that. We pay for security. We pay for our promotional events. And the only income we get is from your generosity at our events. We've got some of these around the theater, mostly out in front. And if you com feel compelled to contribute, you know, don't, don't feel bad about that. We want you to go ahead and contribute. <laughs> what we don't want you to do is go home tonight and feel guilty <laughs> about not contributing. And then I get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning. You can't sleep. i got to go to your home and accept your contribution so you can get to bed. So avoid that whole thing. Just contribute a little money before you leave. All right? Thank you. Now we've got uh, Jim Fontana is going to make some introductions. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, before I introduce our guest speakers for this afternoon, I'd like to try to set the stage for you, to put the subject of stealth jihad in its proper context. Okay? Now, first of all, we're not going to be talking about Islam, the religion, today. Islam is a belief system that provides a complete guide to human existence from cradle to grave, governing all matters, political, social, cultural, legal, financial, Military, and yes, religious. 
Most of Islam is innately political. In fact, critical analyses have shown that roughly 60% of the sacred text of Islam to be political in nature. You can go ahead and move the next slide up. Nope, one before that. Roughly 60% of the religious text to be political in nature, most of which describe how the believer treats the non-believer or how one governs the infidel. So, to be clear, we are not going to be talking about stealth jihad today as a religious subject, but rather as a political subject. Not as a religious issue, but as a national security issue. Most of you have no doubt seen images of Muslims praying in the street in New York City. Well, arguably, praying is religious, but doing it in the street and blocking traffic is political. Similarly, constructing a new mosque can be innately religious, but doing it on ground zero is political. Now, the subject of religious choice is personally a matter of freedom, individual freedom in this country, protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. But religious ideolo political ideology is very much a matter of public discourse in this country. So our guests today, our guests will be speaking within that context. So now, with our focus firmly on political Islam, it's important that I say a few words about Sharia law. Because it is Sharia law that codifies the rules of governance for political Islam. And it is Sharia law that threatens our constitutional republic, our way of life. So very briefly, Sharia law is based on the Quran and other religious documents. First and foremost, it rejects secular democracy. It is totalitarian in design, and it does not separate church from state. That sums it up. No religious freedom of religion, speech, thought, expression, press, no democracy, no equal protection under the law. One set of law for male Muslims, another for women, and another for non-Muslims. There is nothing good for non-Muslims in the Sharia. Now you might ask, why would anyone, Muslim or non-Muslim, embrace the Sharia? Well, Islamic scholars have an answer for you. They claim that because Western law, U.S. law, is man-made, it's temporary, it's limited, and it's going to fade away. But Sharia law, it's sacred, comes from Allah. Therefore, it's perfect, it's universal, and it's eternal. And that's all they need to know. Now, if you want to know a little more, commercial, we have some books for sale in the lobby titled Sharia Law for the Non-Muslim. Take you two hours to work your way through it. Piece of cake. I recommend you pick up a copy. In fact, I recommend you pick up a couple of copies to give to your elected officials. Now, let's, let's turn to the subject of jihad, because after all, our subject today is stealth jihad. It only makes sense that we understand a little bit about jihad itself. So, where would one look? Well, there's one place. The basic question is, is it a holy war waged on behalf of Islam as a religious duty to establish a global Islamic state under Sharia law? Or is it a spiritual struggle? It is a personal struggle, simply to become a better Muslim. So one place to look is the dictionary. And I grew up with Merriam-Webster, so that's the one I chose to put up there. And that, that's interesting. Uh, it doesn't answer our question, but it does sort of bound the answer. So let's take a look at an Islamic dictionary, see what it has to say. That's more interesting. I think now we're getting somewhere. It doesn't mention anything about a spiritual struggle. And it certainly is, has more specificity. And we know that some Muslims accept this definition. Certainly the folks in Al-Qaeda and their affiliates do. There's a gent named Dr. Bill Warner. He's the founder of the Center for the Study of Political Islam. And he's also the author of the book on Sharia law that I just mentioned. He did a rigorous statistical analysis of the sacred text of Islam and found that 31% are devoted to jihad. That's interesting. But more importantly, his, his analysis also established that of that 31%, only 3% addressed the spiritual struggle. 97% referred to warfare against the infidel. So, have any of you ever heard of the book, Reliance of the Traveler? Oh, uh, it's a shame. 
Reliance of the Traveler is one of the most important documents ever written on Islamic jurisprudence. And though it is some 600 years old, it is still considered to be the classic manual of Islamic sacred law and is said by Islamic scholars to be as relevant today as the day it was written. And it says, jihad means to wage war against non-Muslims and is derived from the word mujahada, signifying warfare to establish religion. I think we're getting there, folks. Let's take a look and see what some of the more prominent Muslim scholars and leaders have said. Next slide. Muslim Brotherhood's chief theoretician, Saeed Qutb, wrote in his landmark book, Milestones, the reason for jihad, which have been described in the verses, that's the Quran and the other sacred texts, are these, to establish God's authority on earth, to arrange human affairs according to true guidance provided by God, to abolish all satanic forces and satanic systems of life. Now let me help you break the code, folks. By satanic systems of life, the author is referring to the way of life practiced by Western liberal democracies. That's us, folks. And that should also give you a little clue as to the origin of the terms Great Satan and Little Satan, often applied to the U.S. and Israel, most, most often by past and present leaders of the theocratic state of Iran. Next slide. The founder of the Muslim Brotherhood himself, Hassan al-Ban, my favorite Egyptian, said, it is the nature of Islam to dominate, not to be dominated, to impose its law on all nations and to extend its power to the entire planet. Next slide. And this, this will be the last one in this because I don't want to beat a dead horse, particularly in Ramona. <laughs> Muhammad Akif, the former Supreme Guide to the Muslim Brotherhood, said in 2005, the Muslim Brotherhood is a global movement whose members cooperate with each other based on the same religious view, the spread of Islam, until it rules the world. Now, I hope you can see where I'm going with this, folks. There's a preponderance of ev evidence that the most respected and influential Islamic leaders and scholars from the birth of the Quran through the establishment of the modern-day Muslim Brotherhood embrace jihad as a holy war to advance Islam. And folks, that interpretation dominates political thought within Islam today. Now, jihad in the form of violence and terror has dominated our attention since 9-11. But the far greater threat, especially over the long haul, is one that the Muslim Brotherhood calls civilization jihad, a form of warfare more often referred to stealth, stealth jihad. You got it. Stealth jihad describes the nonviolent tactics Islamists are used to un undermine our democratic institutions from within, their strategy involves seizing power within the institutions of modern civil society, such as our courts, banks, churches, academia, the media, government, and more, and then yielding them as weapons against the West. Unfortunately, the overreach of Muslim terrorists has been a boon to this movement because the bloodbath brought on by Al-Qaeda and its affiliates has been so atrocious that it's enabled the more measured Muslim extremists, the more methodical Muslim extremists to operate under the radar and thereby be regarded by the masses here as moderate, as cause for hope, even though their goal is exactly the same as the terrorists. Next slide, let's see what it is. Muhammad Akram. No, nope, go back. Muhammad Akhar, he, uh, he is one of the top Muslim Brotherhood operatives in the United States. And he laid out the stealth plan for the West, for the United States. When he said, the Muslim Brotherhood must understand that their work in America is a kind of a grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions. Now, he made this statement in a me Muslim Brotherhood memorandum from the early 1990s, which laid out a plan to conquer and Islamize the United States. Now, that was, that was just a starting point because that was all part of a plan to establish a global Islamic state. He went on to say, next slide, 
In America, it would be extremely difficult to promote Islam by means of terror attacks. Thus, the Brotherhood's priority would be to settle Islam and the Brotherhood movement in the United States by way of Islamic organizations posing as civil rights groups so that Islam, and this is my emphasis, so that Islam would be incrementally accepted and enabled within the souls, minds, and the lives of the people of this country. Now, with those emphasized words firmly in our minds, then understandably one of the most insidious forms of self-jihad is its assault on our educational system. It's assault on the minds of our kids and our grandkids. Taking a playbook, taking a page from the playbook of the far left, the very successful playbook of the far left, the Islamists have chosen to infiltrate our educational system from bottom to top in order to inculcate our children with a false view of Islam. Why? To shape future generations so that Islam would be incrementally accepted and enabled within the souls, minds, and lives of the people of our country. Next slide. So, folks, that is the subject of our stealth jihad forum today. We're going to examine the stealth jihad assault on our educational system from bottom to top. You can go ahead and start raising that view graph or that slide. Now we're going to take a little pause here as we bring the screen up and move the lectern so that uh, our first group of speakers can tell you their story. And then I'll be right back as soon as we do that. Our first group of speakers for this afternoon are going to be our neighbors from the local chapter of Brigitte Gabriel's Act for America. You'll be hearing from Mr. Mike Hayuton, Ms. Linda Saxt, and Mr. Jim Friedman. Together they'll give you some insight into what is being taught to our middle school kids about Islam and what the three of them are trying to do about it. Now they are not paid members of Act for America staff. They are just regular folks who work for a living and just re lead regular lives. Only in their case, they've made it their business to find out what is being taught to our kids in our public school system. I think you'll be impressed with their initiative, what their successes is, and what regular folks can accomplish. So, first up, the leader of the San Diego chapter of Act for America, Mr. Michael Hayut, and please give him a warm welcome. I'm a little bit shorter than he is. Um, I want to thank uh, Jim Fontana and Ramona Teed for giving us the opportunity to tell our story about working to correct the, the errors in the California 7th grade history textbook with reference to Islam. We're particular, particularly grateful to, how, to David Horowitz for filling up this room for us. <laughs> we just saw a couple of... We just saw a couple of videos that describe the nature of the problem. The problem is a large problem. And what Jim, Linda, and I are here to tell you is that all of us can do something and play a role. Maybe we can set an example and encourage each and every one of you to take a part in making the changes we need to make with reference to the problems with radical Islam. Failing to tell our young people the unvarnished truth about the origins growth and tenants involved with the rise and spread of Islam opens the door to stealth jihad. As our children go off to college and receive more misinformation for, about Islam, they will be ill-prepared to deal with the dangers posed by stealth jihad. Stealth jihad involves the nonviolent imposition of Islamic law, Sharia, into the, our economic affairs, our cultural affairs, our legal system, and our educational system. Linda, Jim, and I have painstakingly spent hundreds of hours to research and produce an analysis and a supplement that should be sent into every classroom to correct the errors, omissions, and distortions in the current textbook. Our seventh graders in California spend two weeks studying these two chapters each year. We found 22 major errors that demand correction. In the course of our efforts to effect change, first at the local 
school level, and then at the state level, we have garnered the attention of some print and broadcast media. With the help of YouTube, an interview we did for the Christian Broadcast Network was picked up on a variety of local TV stations. This is the kind of exposure that is critical if we're to inform parents and pressure the state to address our concerns. What are our goals? Number one, get on the state school board agenda. Get at, on the agenda at one of their meetings. Number two, get our supplement into the classroom. And three, get our supplement and our analysis into the hands of as many students and parents as is possible. The more media attention and the more venues we have to tell our story, the more pressure we can, we can rally to impress upon the state school board the need to insist that our kids get an accurate historical education. The text textbook adoption process is currently in suspension. We are not likely to have new history textbooks for years. Hence, the importance of our supplement. You can pick up a copy of our supplement at the front of the theater for $2, the cost of copying, or you can email me at a secureamerica at gmail.com. That's a secureamerica at gmail.com, and I can email you a free copy. It's also an opportunity to let me know if you want to get involved with Act for America here in San Diego. When the adoption process begins again, we all should become active in the process of evaluating the standards that we use to select textbooks. Both public and expert input will be needed. Why should we care if a seventh grade textbook camouflages the intolerant, misogynist, and violent aspects of Islamic history. Because Sharia law, the laws that form the basis of Islam, are incompatible with the Western values of liberty, pluralism, religious freedom, basic human rights, a free press, and a secular government. So what does this textbook do? The textbook, the one that we use here in California, romanticizes Islamic history by avoiding or downplaying those episodes and the practices that demonstrate the intolerant, the violent, and the theocratic nature of Islam. This is particularly disturbing because our history textbooks don't hesitate to describe in de detail the problematic episodes of American history. To be perfectly clear, and please listen very carefully, especially if there's somebody from the press in the audience, those who would choose to indict all Muslims and those, on the other hand, who would characterize the demand for accuracy in the recounting of history as some form of bigotry, please listen. We do not assert that all or most Muslims reject any or all of the precious rights and values that characterize America. We know that there are many secular Muslims, non-radical practicing Muslims, who embrace American values, and even some very courageous reformist Muslims who fully acknowledge the necessity for the changes we demand. Some of them have worked with us. Nonetheless, we demand that the truth about the history of the period covered in the textbook be reported accurately. The good, the bad, and the ugly deserve equal treatment. Our guiding light is truth. 